my statisticians. This is Professor Sampson from PSI Love Math. Back with kind of a statistical failure. Uh, not so much. So you see, it's a little bit different. I got my office. And okay. Ain't nobody got time for that. We're going to be doing all definitions. So we're going to run a PowerPoint today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe, subscribe to the channel. So let's get right into these definitions. So what we'll be going through today is what I would call chapter eight, but if you're in another book with another class, this is just confidence intervals. Now, confidence intervals is the beginning of some fun stuff with statistics. So we're gonna start with what's in our section is 8.1, but just so you know, it's estimate, estimate and population means when sigma is known. Now, just for a general rule, sigma isn't known in the real life. So when you're doing real life statistics, sigma is not known because that is the population standard deviation, right? So the population standard deviation can't be known because that means that you took a census of your population. And as we know, uh, it's difficult to get a census of your population to get information from every person in your population. So here's some background information just to get us started. Statistical analysis is used to estimate population parameters. That's what we use it for. We want to estimate our, something that's going on, a parameter in our population, and we use a sample to do that. So the main purpose of statistics is to provide information so that an informed decision can be made. And informed decision can be made from the information that we get. That's what we're using statistics for. And if we remember, inferential statistics is the branch of statistics that uses sample statistics to provide estimates for population parameters. So in your first introduction with all of your definitions in statistics, you learned that samples go with statistics and parameters go with population. So inferential statistics talks about the sample statistics that we get. We use that sample to make a guesstimate, an estimate on the population parameters with some type of certainty. So that's what we're doing here in statistics. So if we use one particular number to estimate our population, we call that a point estimate. So now let's get into these definitions. Oh, hell no! The first definition is point estimate. A point estimate is a single number estimate of a population parameter. So one number that tells us about this population parameter kind of interesting because you would think one number for a population parameter doesn't really lead us to be error free, right? And this, this estimator also needs to be unbiased. Unbiased means that it does not consistently overestimate or underestimate whatever the population parameter that you're talking. So let's think about it this way. If you have the mean, if you're trying to find something centered around the data, and we had three ways of determining center, right? We had mean, median and mode. Well, for an unbiased estimate, we can't use mode because we know that mode does not have to center around the data. Mode can be a higher number or a lower number. It's just any number that repeats itself the most. So it's not necessarily most of the time going to be around the center. Then there's median. Median is the middle of the data, but it doesn't necessarily center around that data. What we're going to say is the best point estimate for a population mean is the same Mean, because the sample mean is an unbiased estimate. Let's say that again, that's important. The best point estimate for the population mean is the sample mean because it is an unbiased estimate. It doesn't consistently overestimate or underestimate the population parameter. And you notice we use the word consistently. So we just talked about this number thing. So like I said earlier, if you have one number, all right, one number, seven, that's going to estimate your whole population. That doesn't seem to be it seems to be more error friendly that you're going to get more errors. Think about it. Let's say if you had a jar of penny and somebody said, tell me how many pennies are in that jar. Well, if you have to get it exactly on point, that's kind of difficult. But then what if they say, well, tell me an interval. Tell me a range of pennies between 100 and 175. A range is better for you because it leaves for less error. You know that if you have one point estimate, it's going to give you more error in theory, right? Then having a range of numbers, the probability that you're within the range is definitely higher than the probability that you got one single estimate of that. That so the interval estimate is a range of possible values for a population parameter. So we have this range, right? Have this range from 100 to 150. Whether I said my point estimate is 125, 
five, which is an exact number, right? Or I said my estimate was between 100 and 175. Either way, I don't know whether any of those numbers are good. They could have been made up out of the top of my head, which they were. And I, oh. So what I need to do is find myself a level of confidence. How confident am I of my information, of my data? So the level of confidence, and we use that, we use the notation C, the letter C, to indicate the level of confidence, is the percentage of all possible samples of a given size that will produce interval estimates that contain your actual parameter. It's not the percent that the parameter is going to be there. It's that I'm going to pull out interval samples. I'm going to pull out samples, all right, of size n. And I'll get me an interval estimate, and that interval estimate will contain the actual parameter. And all of this together makes us have a confidence interval. A confidence interval is an interval estimate associated with a certain level of confidence. If you look at any polling, it should say there are 55% of the people are going to vote for this person plus or minus some, plus or minus 6%, plus or minus 3%, plus or minus something. But that plus or minus something is called your margin of error. It is the largest possible distance from the point estimate that a confidence interval will cover. So like I said, the number plus or minus something. Your point estimate, remember your point estimate for your mean was the sample mean. So it's X bar plus or minus some number, some error. So you account, you're taking into account that there is some error in my data, some sampling error. There's some sampling error because I did not have the population. And the last definition that I want to put up here that you might not understand right away that I'll explain a little bit later is going to be one of the most important ones, which is critical Z value. A critical Z value labeled negative Z alpha over two. That's what it is. That's the alpha symbol over two and Z alpha over two. So one is negative, one is positive. Marks the boundaries for the area under the middle of the standard normal curve that corresponds with a particular level of confidence. C. I have no idea what you're talking about. So the critical values are those boundaries. Think about the area under the curve we just covered. The area under the curve. And it's going to be those boundaries that we made when we worked on the area under the curve. But we're going to use our confidence level to determine what those boundaries are going to be. So those are all of the definitions. So let's put all of this stuff together. So now we're going to put this all together. What does it all mean? Okay, so the first thing is we started off with point estimate and we said we're talking about mean. So this section is about estimating population means when sigma is known. So we started off with the point estimate and we said the best point estimate for the population mean is going to be the what? The sample mean, which is the X bar. Then from that, we wanted to add or subtract some error and that's going to be our confidence in it. We're going to subtract the error and in between adding and subtracting the error, you're hoping that your data is going to have your population parameter, in this case, your population mean. So this is how we do our confidence interval. So we need an E. So technically, if I gave you an example and I said, hey, the X bar 15.7 and your error is 0.6, and I gave you both of these, then you could get me a confidence interval. The confidence interval will be 15.7 minus 0.6 is less than u is less than 15.7 plus 0.6. So with that being the case, we would have 15.1 is less than mu is less than 16.3. So this would be our confidence interval right here. Basically getting a confidence interval is as easy as adding or subtracting your error, right? Your error term. Well, of course, this is statistics, so we're not going to be given the error term. You're in my class just so that you know that you need to write it in this form because I use the charts. Your instructor may use something different. On the calculator, they're going to give it to you like this. This will be marked wrong in my class because I don't know if you know which parameter we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about mu. As we move on, we'll have different parameters in there. So I need to know that you know. So back to what we were saying. Now, if we're given E, then it's an easy problem. But of course, we're not going to be given E. So we need a formula for E. So the formula for E is Z alpha over two times sigma over the square root of N. And this is when sigma is known. No. So let's draw a quick picture. So let's say my confidence level is 95%. Now we know we can do this. So let's say if we said that the confidence level is 95%. Well, we know area under the curve is 
0.95. So let's say our confidence level is 95%. That's the middle part. That's the middle area of the standard normal curve, 0.95. And this confidence level, remember, we said that that was C. So C equals 0.95. C equals 0.95 is this middle part. Okay, so the question is, how do we get the outer part? And you should know by now that the area under the curve equals one. So in order to get the outer part, you have to do what? One minus C, and that is actually called alpha. So alpha is the complement of C. Alpha is the complement of C. That takes care of the total outside. So this area right here is going to be what? What is this green area gonna be? Well, this green area is alpha, one minus C. So in our case, the green area is point, point zero 0.05, right? One minus C. So the green alpha is the rest of the area under the curve. So that's the total area. But I need a confidence interval with a left side and a right side. So how am I going to get this individual green side here and this individual side here? Remember, they are symmetric on the normal distribution curve. They're symmetric. So I'm going to take alpha and divide it by two. If I divide alpha by two, my area under the curve is what? Still one, but this is the negative side. So this is negative Z alpha over two, and this is positive Z alpha over two. So all of that together will add up to one. And if I use 0.95, 1 minus 0.95 gave me 0.05, right? And then I would have to divide that by 2 to get both of my other ends. So if this is 0.95, that means that this is 0.025, and this is 0.025. So that's Z alpha over 2. You already know sigma over the square root of n. So this is the error formula right here, and this is how we get it, and that's what Z alpha over 2 is. Last but not least, this is the confidence interval for a population mean. And this right here is called the margin of error. And just so you know, for my class, the margin of error is rounded to six decimal places. So anytime you write down the margin of error for anything in my class, the margin of error needs to be six decimal places. Why? Because this keeps you from having errors that you carry on and on and on into your next calculation. Remember, statistics is rounded at the end of your data. But the margin of error is six decimal places to make sure that your rounding will be appropriate by the time you get through all the other calculations. So we have the confidence interval for the population mean, and we have the margin of error. Recap, the rounding rule for X bar is if there's data, meaning that you will be putting in L1, L2 or something, one more than the highest data place, the highest decimal place listed. If there's no data, for example, in this example, there was no data, then you are to round to the parameter that's given. So since this is one decimal place, this has to be one decimal place. You can't be more precise than the decimal place that was listed. So let, the last thing we want to take care of in this E thing, so we know what E is. We know what Z alpha over 2 is. We do know what sigma is. That's the population standard deviation. And we're assuming that that's known. And then this is N. So remember, as in any other algebraic formula, we can move around anything and solve for another the variable. So they could give you any three of these variables and have you solve for another. Now, just for fun, I'm going to show you how to solve for n, and then I'll show you the formula. But we can rewrite this to look like this. We can rewrite this as just a quick, quick rewrite, z alpha over 2 times sigma all over square root of n. Do a little algebra, cross multiply. You have e times the square root of n is equal to z alpha over 2 times sigma. We try to solve for n, divide by e, divide by e. Now we have the square root of n is equal to z alpha over 2 times sigma over e. And earlier in the semester, I said, how do you get rid of a square root? And many of you commented down below, told me you had to square it, and you remembered it. So the formula to find n is equal to z alpha over 2 times sigma all over e squared. So this n that we found is the minimum sample size for estimating a population mean. That's what this n is. This n is the minimum sample size for estimating a population mean. Regardless of what number comes up for your minimum sample
sample size, you go up to the next whole number. It's not a rounding rule, it's just a rule. So go up to the next whole number. It should make sense, why? Because if you're working with children, you can't have 15.1 children, okay? You can't have 15.1. So it doesn't matter if it's 15.1, 15.00125, 15.7, doesn't matter what it is. If this has a decimal, then all of these are going to be rounded up to 16. It's not a rounding rule. So don't say, well, I looked behind this one and I saw that there was a one and I didn't round it up. No, it's not a rounding rule. You just have to go to the next number, which makes sense. If you're trying to take into account, you got a number and it says 15.1 kids, you can't take 15 because you're leaving out some of your data. So you have to go up to the next number, which is 16. So that actually concludes all of the definitions. We'll have a part two of this video where we actually work on problems and use all of these definitions and all of these formulas to answer questions and to get confidence for our population when our standard don't call me up so that's about it this is professor i love math